to, to Vilnius, to Lithuania, to Vilnius Jewish Public Library. And then we'll have short words from some guests of ours, and then we'll, we will have an opportunity to give questions to Moshe and to, for him to answer if, some questions, but not too much. Other, uh, other time will be dedicated for informal communication in the next room to have some wine, refreshments, and snacks. So, Moshe, thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Now the I uh, spent as much time as I could trying to make a list of all of the dignitaries that Zilvinus had invited, and I'm I'm hearing impaired. I don't. I actually am deaf. With, but get some help from these devices. Um, I couldn't make out everything, but I heard a long list of dignitaries from ambassadors and representatives, cultural, finance, the, uh, uh, foreign affairs, and special ambassadors, and, and uh, uh, that uh, I'm not, not going to read that list, but I want to begin by thanking you for coming. I want to thank you not only because you came but I realized with such a long list, if you didn't come, there wouldn't be anybody here. <laughs> I think that everybody had a title of some sort. Um, a little logistics first. Somewhere in Lithuania, there is a jacket that matches these <laughs> pants. Because I brought from San Francisco to uh, Chicago, to Helsinki, to Vilnius, I brought my suit. But the jacket is not with me. I have a younger brother who insists that I look dignified, so he gave me his jacket, which is why it doesn't match my pants. I'm not comfortable anymore. I wouldn't tell it. The second thing I want to say is that whenever I've been given the opportunity to speak, Barbara always says to me, remember, keep it short. She's not talking about size, I'm stuck with whatever height I have, but rather she's talking about length. And she reminds me of that every time because she knows how many times I didn't listen to her and I went on much, much too long. And uh, I would like this to be an exception to that rule, mainly be not because I think I don't have enough to tell you, but because I really want to leave some time for interaction. Uh, it's impossible to guess what questions or comments are in people's minds, and I want us to be able to have that opportunity. And I also don't want you to leave as soon as we finish speaking, because my brothers and, uh, uh, and Barbara were kind enough to sponsor a beautiful reception and refreshments, some things that uh, they were able to prepare, so that we have an opportunity to sit around and munch something while we meet each other. And I mean you meeting each other as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm a, an American born, just turned 78 year old, Litvak, who graduated the Jewish Theological Seminary of America with the title Rabbi. 50 years ago, in May 1969. Immediately, they put me on a plane, sending me to Travis Air Force Base to become a chaplain in the United States Air Force because the war was raging and there were many, many Jewish personnel, all men, at that time women did not go to the theater, sent to the area of Southeast Asia, Vietnam, the Air Forces in Thailand, etc. And I spent two years there as a chaplain and a one-year combat tour, but it was tremendously gratifying and that's another completely different story. And I've served in four major pulpits. I, uh, in Washington, D.C., in Los <laughs> Angeles, in San Diego, and now finally in San Francisco. And in addition, a two-year stint on the Dutch island of Curaçao in, uh, near the coast of Venezuela. Almost like the diplomatic corps kind of got uh, sent around with incredible experiences in my life. And over these years, even before I went to rabbinical school, 
I began to buy books to read, to study. I was a student at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem in class with Amos Oz, interestingly enough. Yeah? When he was uh, not Oz then, he was uh, like Kranzel or something. Krausen. And, uh, and I studied uh, archaeology with Krausen. Krausen. And I studied archaeology with Yigal Yadin when he was digging in Matsada. And I had incredible experiences. Today, thanks to a very, very special person, Regina Kapalovich, who is an incredible guide of Jewish Vilnius, who's standing sitting over there. I don't know why there, but it must be the woman. And, uh, and I learned that Abraham Joshua Heschel, who was one of my teachers, studied at the Vilnius Gymnasium. And I, I had an incredible, incredible career. Incredible. And all along was always picking up books to prepare for sermons, for teaching, uh, for collection, etc. And the time came for my second retirement. I have retired twice. In the year two, 1990, I had a little pimple on the back of my neck, and I was diagnosed with terminal cancer. It's not Hodgkin lymphoma. The world's greatest expert, Saul Rosenberg and Stanford University Medical Center, told me I had about seven, eight, maybe nine years to live. It was slow growing and then kaput. Maybe another year, maybe earlier, but get hit by a truck. That's the only way it will be different. And um, I was at that time in San Diego at the conservative synagogue in La Jolla. And um, about ten years later, I was still alive, but I had six children, three of them quite young. I was uh, given the opportunity to retire earlier than would be typical, so that I could spend the last few years, however it would be, with my young children. And uh, books had already played an important part of my life, so as a testimony to me, and after some 30 years in the rabbinate, they dedicated a, the library as the Rabbi Moshe Levin Library in the synagogue. I accepted a request by the Rabbinical Assembly to go to spend weekends in San Francisco for one year for an elderly congregation that didn't have their own rabbi in quite a while. And, um, and I started again in the rabbinate after this first retirement. And that one year for weekends turned into 17 years. And in the course of that time, I was informed that my cancer did not come back a fourth time after bone marrow transplant, everything like that. And, um, and 10 years after no evidence of the return, I was pronounced cured. And it was miraculous, I don't mean in a religious sense, I mean in a scientific sense. It was miraculous, but it gave me the opportunity to continue as a rabbi for that many more years, as well as a father and a husband and a, uh, and a human being. But not as a Litvak. I didn't really know anything about being a Litvak except two things. Number one, in the city of Vilnius, which is the center of Litvak history, it was what they called the Jerusalem of the North. Here is an article from 1977 in a newspaper in San Francisco describing the Jerusalem of Lithuania. It was a known fact throughout the Jewish community. There, in, in uh, South Africa, where there were many, many people originally from Lithuania, and in all parts of the United States, and of course in Israel. The second thing I knew about being a Litva was that we were identified because we were not Galatianos. Our world, the Orthodox Yeshiva world, was divided in two. There were the Gal Litvaks and the Galatianos. And because my father was born in Yanova, and my mother's father was born in Sarai. We were Litvaks. And 
That made us much better than the Galatianas, <laughs> although they didn't agree. <laughs> that was about all I knew. In 2006, my brother Nachum went with his wife and another couple to Eastern Europe, and they came to with Lithuania. And when he came back, I spoke to him on the telephone because he lives on the other side of the country. And I said, what did you find? And he said, nothing. It's all gone. It's all gone. So I never had any interest in being here. But I made two friends from Lithuania. A woman who was a, the doctorate was a researcher in the field of oncology of cancer, living in San Diego. She was born in Lithuania. Her parents, at the age of 15, spirited her to Israel, where they had already sent her older brother. And she came back, got a doctorate in London, went to, Los, to, to San Diego, had a position over there. And I was diagnosed with this terminal cancer. And she became a help to me to, to examine the most uh, up-to-date uh, uh, treatments, etc., to evaluate them. And she when she was growing up in Vilna, she had a boyfriend. He wasn't Jewish. His name was Rimas. And they met again, and then through her, I met him. He's a filmmaker who was teaching film at the university, and he was making a film, of all things, about a Lithuanian pilot who was saving Jews during the Holocaust. I even saw the trailer of the film, and I was impressed. And he said to me, Moshe, you have to come to Vilna. You must come. I kept putting it off. In 2015, I was one of 25 rabbis from the San Francisco Bay Area that were asked to come to Warsaw to see the new museum called Poland one of the major philanthropists for that museum and behind it, etc., was in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in San Francisco. And the German uh, uh, embassy actually invited us to come to Berlin also, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and it was an incredible trip. And when I looked at the maps, I realized I won't be so far from Lithuania. I called Rimas, and I said, Will you be in the city in November 2015? He said, yes. And the next thing I knew, I flew from Berlin to Vilnius. He picked me up at the airport and he said, we're not going to your hotel. It was 8 o'clock at night. Instead, he came here and says, I want you to meet somebody. And he introduced me to Zephanas. This man is the director and the head of this Vilnius Jewish Public Library. And I want you to meet him. Why? Do I have to meet him now at the night? As soon as I met children, I realized why. He said to me, I understand your family comes from Yonava. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to pick you up at the hotel at 8 o'clock. And we're going to go, it turned out, with a woman named Dalia Epstein who was born in Yanova, lived through the Holocaust and Vilnius, hidden and what have you, but remembered that experience and things that she knew about it. And she's coming with us to show you the town. And that began to open my eyes to what it means to have a connection with Lithuania, to be a Litvak, and to be connected with a country that was known as Yerushalayim Shalatzafon, Jerusalem of the North. When I reached nearly 50 years as a rabbi, it was time for my second retirement. The books that existed in La Jolla, in the library, the people in La Jolla had donated books that they felt that they needed. And I didn't feel strongly about moving my collection in San Francisco to La Jolla, to San Diego, because at least I saw the young people were never going into that library. They were going online. And that was before Wikipedia. Now they don't have to go to a library, they don't even go to a computer, it's all on their phone. But I was under incredible pressure 
not to donate my books here. When I came that first night, these shelves were virtually empty. Empty. Rooms, shelves, not many books. And I decided I wanted to donate the books that I'd collected over these 50, 60 years because I started collecting and, and reading books for my studies long before I even went to rabbinical school. I wanted to donate them here. And I was under intense pressure not to do that. My successor, the rabbi who took my position in San Francisco, she and the president of the congregation said, why do you want to send your books to a country where the Jews are dead? Why would you not leave them here? There's life with here in America, the Jewish, the Jewish community. It's alive, it's vibrant, it's exciting. That's where the books belong. You want to send them something? Send them a plaque about the Holocaust. There's nothing there. And I was up this pressure again and again constantly. And I stood by my decision, no. My books have to come here. And the real thing I want to tell you tonight is why. What were my reasons of insisting that this collection, which is probably close to a thousand books, belongs in Vilnius and not in San Francisco, or La Jolla, or Los Angeles, or Washington, D.C., or any other place that I've touched in my life? And there are really three main reasons. The first was the information that led me to break my stereotype of non-Jews from Eastern Europe. Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, other places as well. In our minds, with the way I was raised, the world was divided in two. There were the Jews, and there were those who abandoned the Jews. That's the world. There are people who are born Jewish, have a tremendous sense of significance, purpose, mission in the world and life, and there were anti-Semites. Within the anti-Semites, there were those who were actively anti-Semites, and those who were passive anti-Semites. Scratch their skin, you'll find an anti-Semite. What's the proof? The proof was that nobody in that non-Jewish world in Eastern Europe acknowledged what happened in the Holocaust. It was blank. It, was, it wasn't there. It was denial. And who would deny such a thing? What I learned here was that was the narrative that we might have been told. But it was much, much more complex than that. That the fact of the matter is that the reason that we didn't hear much about what happened in the Holocaust in places like Poland and Lithuania and other places, the reason that people my age did not speak of it or even or claim that they knew about it, you already know. You know because you know what happened during the Soviet regime in Lithuania and Poland and other places. Which was, it was the interest of the Soviets to delete from modern history the martyrdom of the Jews. It wasn't just because of Russian anti-Semitism. It was the political agenda of turning a country that hated the Russians into people who would hate the Germans. And that wasn't an easy task. So the mass graves of 10,000 Jews who died here, and 8,000 Jews who were shot here, and these were deported here, that reality was switched into 10,000 Lithuanian freedom fighters. 8,000 Soviet citizens of Lithuanian origin. Martyrs, who killed them? The horrible Germans. It's the Nazis, it's the Germans that are your enemy. We are your saviors. 
They were not liberators, even if they seemed that way to you in the beginning of the war. And so, any mention of the Jewish community and its vibrancy before the war was obliterated, and nothing was put into the textbooks. And people grew up in this country not knowing the word, let alone the people and their nature. I learned about the Holocaust in the early 1950s. That's when I saw people come and take jobs in the bakery and in push carts, etc., with numbers on their arms. I was a child, and I was told, these are the refugees. These are the ones who survived. But if I lived here, I would not know of any of them, not from 1950, not until 1990, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, when little by little by little, the actual history began to creep back into the public knowledge. How? I don't know for sure, but I suspect it's because people who were third generation, second, third, now soon fourth generation from the Holocaust, began asking the questions about the markings on the buildings that we saw today that uh, Gina Shirmi uh, showed us, and I've seen, this is my third trip to Lithuania. Father, why are the Hebrew letters over there on that building? Why does the gymnasium here have a ten, ten, uh, tablets of uh, uh, where the, 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 the Ten Commandments? Why is there a Star of David on this building? Why is there a plaque on what was then the Austrian embassy, now it's the Romanian embassy, said this belonged to the Jewish community. Who were these people? Nobody was going to talk about it before. The really older generation, the generation now that's dying or gone, they were not going to speak about it because too many of them were perpetrators and collaborators. Their children, who may have been teenagers at the time, would not talk about it because they'd learned silence. And their children? would know nothing. And so they're asking, why? Who were these people? That is not enough of a reason for me to have decided my book should come here. And I'll tell you why. My books are not about the Holocaust. I collected my books after the Holocaust. Yes, there are some books that were about the Holocaust and about the Jews in different places. <coughs> Because, but those were books published after the war. I don't have a collection of old Sfarim, of the old texts of the, of the, that shows the greatness and the, and, and the learning that occurred in places like Vilnius or publishing in, in, in Poland. Or in, I don't, that's not my collection. My collection is a contemporary collection. So what good is it to bring books about Judaism and the Jewish people in today's world in the United States, in Israel, in Europe. <clears throat> what purpose is there bring it there? It's not going to bring back the memory of those who perish. So why? And here are my three reasons. If young people who are asking those questions come and take a look at any of these books, they will see that the crime of the murder of six million Jews was not a crime only against the Jews. It was a crime against the whole world. What do I mean? American Judaism and Israeli Judaism, contemporary, current, post-Holocaust, is evidence of what would have happened in places like Lithuania if the 200,000 Jews were not put to death. Where are the Zuckerbergs from Lithuania? Where are the, where are, where's the Ruth Bader Ginsburg who was said that these, when they were children, babies are not yet born, They're shot and killed in Pana. Who would they have been 
If they had survived, if they had lived, if they had a normal life and went to school and got trained in science and mathematics and in, in theater, in literature, how do we know what they would have been like? We look at communities where people did not perish, where Jews did not perish. If you see the vibrancy of American Jewish life, you learn about what a diaspora community could be like if those little babies in their mother's arms were not shot and thrown into a pit. The crime of the six million was a crime against the world. Who knows how many of those little babies and those not yet born would have found cures to cancer, would have been like uh, 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 the cure for polio, uh, salt, uh, Jonas Salk. Who would have known, who knows who from that generation that perished, who knows who might have found ways to combat global warming or to produce masterpieces in art or to be able to write books that would be read and translated in 49 languages. The crime against the Jews was a crime against humanity. It left a hole in the world. And how do you see that? When you see the vibrancy of a community like the American Jewish community. Or you look at Israel today. Lithuania could have been the start of nation that Israel is. Because where did those people come from? They came from here or places like this. So the first reason that I said my books should come here is so that the non-Jewish students at the Vilnius University and all others like them would learn what happens when you allow hatred, <clears throat> when you allow people to be stereotyped, when you convince an entire nation that these individuals are vermin, that they're not really human, this is what happens. They perish and you lose. You lose. The second reason. The second reason. I'm very proud to be an American Jew. Because the second reason is it shows what happens to a country and a culture and a society that welcomes multiculturalism, multi-ethnicity. What happens in a country where people of different backgrounds, different religions, different color, different languages live together? This might not be the best example of those times in America. I am in deep, deep pain, deep pain, about what I see that's happening in the country whose passport I hold. But this, I hope, we hear, hope is just a blip in history of the United States. But the reality is that when you have the variety of populations living together, they spark creativity in each other. They learn the value of mutual understanding, reciprocity, discussion, stimulation. Open the San Francisco Chronicle, which is the most widely read paper in Silicon Valley. And look at the business section. And you'll always see quotes from all these businesses of Google and Twitter and da 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 da. Look at the names of the CEOs. Most native-born Americans cannot pronounce the names of the CEOs of the companies that are making their products. Those names are Indian names, Latino names, Swedish names. I don't know where, names that we can't pronounce. Why? Because it was a country for so many years that welcomed immigrants. It welcomed the variety. It saw itself 
not as a melting pot where everybody should become homogeneous, but as a salad where you've got some red cabbage and you've got some green onion, you've got some red tomatoes, you've got a, a, a salad. It stimulates it, it's tasty. That's the greatness of the country that welcomes people from everywhere. And the books show what one group was like thriving in the United States. And despite any kind of stories you may hear about anti-Semitism in the United States, <laughs> the reality is we have it good there. Tremendously good there. Tremendously good there. Why? Because there may be people who love us, there may be people who hate us. But as a government, as a state, as a country, there's no such thing as discrimination based upon religion, sexual gender, uh, color of skin, last name, language, anything like that. So this is one example of what happens in a country that really welcomes everyone. And why is that important here in Lithuania? Why is that message has to be here? Because, as you well know, much better than me, Europe is having much, much more than its share of xenophobia. Country after country claim that these immigrants are changing the nature of the, of the, 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 the character, of the homogeneous character that makes us a nation. That if you want to be French, if you want to live in France, you must be French. And if you want to live in Hungary, you must be Hungarian. If you want to live in Poland, you must be If you want to live in Italy, you must be Italian. What does that mean? It means you have to be cut from the same cloth. We don't want all those different people coming because they will change our society. Yes, they will change our society with stimulation and creativity and challenge. And while I think the Thuania, I certainly hope, is free from that kind of a grip, it doesn't take much to start it. And it has to be nipped in the bud. So the lesson of a thriving community in the United States is an example of how important it is to nip in the bud any attempt to try to keep people out because they're different. There is much that we can learn from them, and we have much to give them. But we must do it with a sense of acceptance and love and care and respect. So, the very last reason. The last reason my books are here is that in the country where my ancestors came, I now have a new identity. Even before this third trip to Lithuania, I feel more than being a Litvak. I'm feeling Lithuania. I have come to love the people I have met in Lithuania without regard for whether they are members of my tribe or not. I'm impressed with the welcome, with the open arms, with the interest, with the personalities and the character of the people where my father, my, my family has come from, could go back possibly 600 <coughs> years. Who knows? Jews were settled here in the 13th century. I feel such a connection that it's becoming a second home to me. And I want to be a part of it. And in order to do that, I have to give something to them. My children have books of their own and interests of their own. I support them in the choices that they make in life. The library in La Jolla has enough books for them. The library in San Francisco, it's all online for them. But here in the Vilnius Jewish Public Library, 
there was an important place. And the Jews who are here, and perhaps Jews yet to come, will find a place that makes them feel at home, just as I have felt. I am grateful for the opportunity of having come four, year, three, uh, four years ago, exactly, and seen empty shells because it gave me a sense of purpose, a mission of what I can do to make a change. So I'm grateful to you, Zodanus, for making it possible that, to have a place for something that I treasure. For Darius Gaidas, the Consul General of Lithuania in Western United States, who made sure that there would be room for 40 large boxes of books in the container that went with him, he came here in September. And I hope to continue that relationship so that the several hundred books I still have in boxes will also find their place and will have to build more shelves. I appreciate your attention. I am very eager to have some uh, interaction. And, uh, and this is, I want to tell you, a great, 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 great moment for me a great moment in my life, my career, the best way to spend 50 years as a rabbi. Thank you, Moshe, for your very emotional speech. Actually, it was very, very touching. And I know you had to tell much more. And also about the books you brought. Maybe you will be able to tell about the books during the interaction. And people will, uh, after we stand up, people will have an opportunity to look around. These yeah. are books are selected and nicer looking with better, um, nicer covers just for exposition. But you see the whole collection starts, <coughs> maybe it neighbors with Peter Brown's song collection and goes, continues all the way to that back wall. So all these shel shelves are filled uh, by the uh, collection of Moshe Levin and, and I guess the inscription above. Padekol Moshe už labai ausminga kalba. Aš atsiprašau, kad neveršiau paralelį, kam reikėjo. Aš pažadu, kad aš įdėsiu į internetą ir rezumėšiu tos kalbos lietuviškai. Tai būtų prailginė mūsų pokalbį. Gerokai, ko gerai. Ir dabar norėčiau paprašyti, tada pakviesti trumpam žodžiui svarbius svečius, kurie taip maloniai sutiko atsėjti šitą renginį. Pirmiausiai kviesčiau mūsų globėjus, mūsų tiems, ką mes priklausom, tai yra kultūros ministerija. Tai su mumis yra viceministrė Ingrida Viliūtė. So I'm asking now uh, the dignitaries to, to say their word. Actually, I'm asking people who, come, who came here for this dedication, and we are very thankful for their coming, to say a few words. First of all, the word goes to, the, uh, to our, uh, our vast uh, Ministry of Culture. We have Deputy Minister of Culture here. Please, Ms. Um, dear ambassadors, dear Rabbi <coughs> Moshe Levin, dear readers of this uh, nice collection. Uh, actually, I'm very happy uh, tonight because of uh, two things. One is that I, could, uh, I had an opportunity to hear your nice uh, story and of course uh, that I'm in my own deck. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulate all library uh, because of this nice uh, donation of this important and even substantial donation for Vilnius Yevish Public Library. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, this library expands uh, its collection only on the basis of personal <coughs> or institutional donations, it is uh, a really big uh, and huge move ahead of our the library's uh, vision uh, one day to become one of the biggest biggest uh, libraries in this kind, I mean in, in the donation <coughs> libraries. 
And of course, uh, all topics of Judaism, uh, Jewish history, Jewish uh, culture, uh, state of Israel, uh, art and literature, it is re represented much better with the arrival of, of this library. And uh, of course, uh, it is very important also the narrative we have, uh, that you give us tonight, and I hope that the narrative will be um, represented to all readers of, of all this library. And uh, the donation of books, as you said, that they come uh, within the big containers, and we are very thankful to the foreign ministry uh, because of this. And it is uh, very important that um, uh, it is, we are bringing back and integrating the rich world of intellectual Yiddish ideas uh, into our current dynamic cultural development. And uh, also we are paying tribute to the victims of the Holocaust. It is very important and uh, even if you don't know who are those people, we are, uh, it is very important to speak about it. And uh, many broad books speak about uh, that too and I hope that all readers will have the opportunity to, to read to speak with the workers of this library and we are also the culture minister, we are thankful that you are working <coughs> in this way. And uh, of course um, uh, we are very happy uh, that uh, you not only brought the books but that you are feeling here in Vilnius uh, as a whole. I think we can share not only not only our city, we can share also our homes too. So we are very thankful and have a good evening and all three Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And from one ministry we, we go to another ministry. Actually, that is that is Guy Dies is on business trip and he was wasn't able to make it today tonight at, to Lithuania. But I know that he did a lot. He was very patient. He he worked with Moshe for several years. He was carrying the boxes uh, with one truck after another. And he was uh, giving storage and taking care of the books, and then he actually, he was the one. And the staff of, of the <coughs> Consulate General, like Justina Berozaitia, I think so, uh, was also very helpful. So, sincere thanks from the library, and sin sincere thanks to the Ministry, now in the name of Danus, uh, Danus United. Please, Danus. Yeah, Rabbi Moshalevi. <laughs> It's, it's very difficult to speak after your sermon, <laughs> and I will be short. Uh, uh, in, in, this, my, in my position as, as an ambassador, uh, special envoy for relations with Jewish communities, with, with Jewish people uh, in Lithuania and, uh, and abroad, I met a, a lot of, of interesting Jewish people. But you are one of the most interesting. <laughs> your, uh, your, your speech tonight was very interesting as well, and touching. Uh, this library was born of, from, from idea, from private uh, idea to connect the native books to Lithuania and to the support of, of support of, of Lithuanian government. So you are you're continuing that, that tradition, you are fulfilling, you, you are uh, giving books to, to, the, uh, to the library and together keeping the tradition, tradition to, to uh, give books to to uh, Vilnius to, to Lithuania. And I congratulate Lithuania, congrat Vilnius that they will have such a, such a nice collection uh, in, in this uh, these premises. Uh, I've I visited the library many times and I'm very happy that I'm very happy of every visit to the library. Had, uh, but one of these uh, meetings here, or uh, events held here, was very interesting, and then I think it is also it touches also your, your history. It was uh, an exhibition, uh, Jewish Faces of Yona, was opened a few years ago, and, and uh, 
explain it. Epstein uh, also uh, attended this opening and we, we talked about that. Uh, so what, what comes to my, my mind tonight? And that's the, the gift that the that, uh, director, of, that uh, Julian is the director of this library. It's, it's, I think it's, it gives, gives them a lot to the, to the library, to the life of it, and, and to, to, to his, his <coughs> feature, his possibility to attract good people is very important for, for, for the library. So, it's, uh, it's, uh, maybe it's a coincidence that I share the same room at the Ministry of Foreign, in, uh, the foreign in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with uh, uh, my dear friend and uh, uh, veteran of, of Lithuanian uh, diplomatic service, uh, Darius Gidis. He, I asked what he would like to, to tell tonight, and he would like to, to speak about that, about uh, people whom, whom the, he met in, in, uh, during his tenure in, in, Los, in Los Angeles, wonderful Litvak people, Litvak, Litvaks. He wanted to speak about the, the good cooperation between, between him and this, our, our uh, diplomatic mission and, and uh, different Jewish organizations in, in, in California. Uh, we have a, 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 a saying, a motto about saying about Lithuanian Foreign Service, that we are born to, to help. Lithuanian Foreign Consular Service is born to help. So I think that uh, Daryl Gadis is a personification of this, uh, this uh, of the motto, and then he is personification of, of uh, Lithuanian uh, Foreign Service. So, yeah. <coughs> I think we, you, you always can, can rely on us, we can trust, and I think all of those. For other next books will be brought to Lithuanian Power House. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, you. Uh, this one moment. I want it's a perfect uh, moment to insert something very small but very important. In each of the times, all three of my visits, we passed the old library, you know, the big building, where now it's being renovated with the green covers over the photographs, etc. It's an enormous library, and that just is testimony to what how vibrant Jewish life was in Vilnius before the war. It was the Lithuania, it was the Jerusalem of the North, and because of its academic level and how important books and, uh, and, and academies were. So I want to tell you something that I haven't yet shared with Vilnius, with, with, with Zhilvanovsky. And that is that... Ambassador, thank you very, very, very much for being here. Was that a kind of... Hey, for And... And that is that when they finish that building, I don't think it's going to be very hard <laughs> to fill it with more Jewish books. The Jewish Community Library of San Francisco, which is one of the most established Jewish libraries in the United States, its head librarian, Dr. Howard Friedman, has advised me that he is going to collect books that are duplicates for that library. And the next time there's a ship in coming to Vilnius, he wants to load it with books from the San Francisco Jewish Community Library. The Los Angeles Jewish Community Library has said the same thing. A story is being considered now for Bloomberg News, a very well-read magazine in the United States, about this idea of a rabbi donating his library. And we believe that many of the Jewish libraries in, this, in different cities in the United States will want to contribute to that library. And my only concern is there will not be enough room for all the books that they would want to donate. So they'll have to get donations, not just to support the library, but also to expand the library. And this can be a center of Jewish uh, learning and books in, the, in, in all of Europe. So, I hope it'll get your dream comes true. Okay. Mine too. And we value very much our connection and the relationship with all the, the 
with all our readers and especially of course we value our connection and cooperation with the Lithuanian Jewish community which is very important for us with their advices, with their help, with their interaction, with common projects, common action. And that's how, uh, that's why I'm so happy, thankful to the chairwoman of the Lithuanian Jewish community to be being here with us tonight. And I'll ask her to say a few words. Hello, everybody. And uh, first of all, on the, on the name of the Jewish community, I would like to thank you from my, all my heart for your donation, because it's donation not only for the library, but for all the Jews of Lithuania, Vilnius. And this is very great that we can meet such people for sharing that what they have gathered all their life with other Jews. But I, I remember my uncle, he wasn't a rebel, but he was a clever. He always, uh, always told me that a clever Jew have to teach the not so clever Jews. <laughs> <laughs> he has always to share his knowledges, his books. If you are so clever and you read all these books, it's better to give it to somebody else who is not so clever and uh, let him become the same clever as, as you are. And it's very interesting, your speech was really very interesting because uh, there are so many points uh, of uh, where we have common interest. Uh, I see you this time in my life, but first of all I admire you as a rebel of the army. For me it's the top of Raboni Mato. That is something unbelievable. Secondly, you, your grandmother is from Seilie, yes. and my family comes from Veshe, which is very close to Seilie. So both of us are not only Litvaks, but Zukai. <laughs> this is a, a small population in uh, uh, Lithuania, and even if you know Lithuanian language, and if you listen how the Dzukai are talking among themselves, you'll need a translator <laughs> to translate you, because not always you'll understand that what uh, uh, they are uh, telling. Uh, Amos Oze is one of my beloved writer and I know both his uh, daughters and mm -hmm. I'm in touch with them uh, with both of them so you see how much uh, common Connection. things connections you can find just by occasion uh, but uh, uh, in the end of my speech because it's much better to drink wine and to speak, but then you do not need a translator. Everybody understands everything. So I want to thank you once more. You hear that the Minister of Culture um, are not, is not able to help uh, this poor library so much as uh, you would like, uh, because uh, it's lack of money and uh, uh, where from they would get such books as, uh, as you donated. It's, it, it is not possible. So we are really very uh, uh, thankful, very grateful that um, uh, uh, you are sharing uh, your books, your library, and uh, other uh, libraries has the same intention to do that. Uh, we have uh, our Vilnius Library. Thank you once more. Actually, we thank you very much, Gerfaina. Uh, and so, it's a pity ambassador, Israeli ambassador had to leave. Actually, he was on the list of speakers, but he probably he has some other event to attend. Yeah. But still, we are very thankful to everybody who came. So maybe let's turn to that informal part when we can communicate and inter interact uh, informally with a glass plastic glass <laughs> in our hands. Hope it's good. Snacks uh, will be also in time. So please enjoy yourself. Have a good time. Yeah. Thank you. I want to also uh, thank the um, 
<laughs> the two women who are on staff of the library, right. uh, Bruna and Karina, yes. who have been very, very helpful. Did the preparation for the refreshments that we're now about to have with the wine and cheese and kipple and so on, whatever the uh, whatever whatever they put out for us. I hope we enjoy each other's company and uh, have a chance to interact. Thank you very much, myself, for being here. So.